uh, thank you very much for the warm uh, introduction and welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I should say that I, I'm uh, a little bit lagging uh, at this uh, late afternoon and after lunch. Uh, I had about an hour night's sleep. Um, I flew in this morning from uh, Tbilisi, Georgia. I understand there are some Georgians with us, uh, but actually addressing a situation there which is uh, uh, sometimes known as a frozen conflict. I think that's an odd moniker. I don't believe for anyone living in a condition of conflict that it's frozen. Uh, it might be frozen for some of us uh, to observe, uh, where the situation is actually, in my view, deteriorating, not improving. Um, and therefore, it's quite incumbent on those of us who are concerned about these issues to engage now uh, to try and reduce the points of friction and to try and bridge differences. And exactly through initiatives such as cultural, uh, on cultural diplomacy, I think it's important uh, that persons in every capacity engage. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I'm here to address you uh, on a broader theme today. And I'd just like to uh, begin with a few uh, observations. Uh, first of all, not all bad things are crimes. And not all crimes are genocide. In fact, not even the worst of crimes are necessarily genocide. That might sound strange to you because we're rather told that there's some kind of hierarchy and genocide is apparently the worst of all crimes. And in fact, there's a tendency to label things as genocide in order to mobilize and motivate in terms of the categorization. But let me just give you a couple of examples of things which are pretty darn bad, but probably not genocide, or not at all. For example, systematic torture. I don't know if you've ever interviewed or met, or might be, a survivor of torture. Uh, but uh, when you have systematic or even syst uh, systemic torture, uh, that is quite bad, but it does not constitute genocide. Uh, neither is mass force displacement, which might not actually uh, entail any immediate physical harm on anyone. But as we heard already from uh, the uh, description of the uh, ambassador uh, of Latvia to the United Nations, uh, forced transfers of population can have amazingly deleterious effects, uh, not only on, uh, on the individuals concerned, but on entire societies. And we can go on and on in terms of a very serious, very bad things that do not constitute genocide. Words have meaning, and it's a good thing they have meaning, and I do think we have to be careful when we uh, consider the topic of genocide or similar uh, atrocities. Uh, let me also observe that it's relatively uh, axiomatic, I would say, and certainly in popular terms quite easy to assert that one is against genocide. One's not normally for genocide, although, of course, the origin of the notion of genocide is the product of exactly a positive determination by a democratically elected government in this country uh, to uh, elaborate a program uh, that entailed uh, on the basis of a, a nationalist hierarchy, uh, the categorization of people, uh, including ultimately the final solution with regard to uh, some categories of persons. Uh, so while it is probably axiomatic to be against genocide, it's not so clear at all what one is for, not against. What is one for? Let me uh, thirdly observe, in my uh, humble view, that early warning is not at all a problem. In fact, I would quite to the contrary say that early warning has been often invoked as uh, what I often categorize as uh, the uh, uh, plethora of excuses. The, the, uh, in this case, if only we knew excuse, uh, then apparently we would have acted. But I think that in most cases, genocides uh, uh, have never, in fact, been instantaneous uh, uh, acts or occurrences, but have been the product of constructed uh, behavior and, uh, and regimes over periods of time with considerable antecedent uh, acts and behavior. Uh, let me just uh, cite a few of these. The so-called preventable genocide, uh, 1994 genocide in Rwanda, so-called preventable because in 1993 the UN Special Rapporteur on the Elimination of uh, uh, Summary Arbitrary Execution uh, actually went to Rwanda and came back almost exactly one year before April 1993, issued a report to the then UN Commission on Human Rights and expressly declared that if no action was taken, a genocide was likely. No action was taken. But we can't say that we didn't know or that it wasn't observed, didn't uh, think it was coming. Let me uh, actually take a, a bit broader uh, reference here, not to a specific case, to a, but to a more general case. Uh, actually to systematic analysis of uh, the treatment uh, and actually suppression of uh, ethnic groups or minorities. 
uh, in the work of Ted Robert Gurr of the University of Maryland, and specifically the Minorities at Risk Project, which has been conducted over some decades now, surveying almost 400 different inter-ethnic conflicts around the world, the result of his uh, comprehensive study, incidentally engaging hundreds of independent experts around the world, uh, is his observation that there is approximately a 10-year gap between what he calls the articulation of grievance by affected communities and the eruption of violence. In the case of Kosovo, that was almost exactly true. In 1989, the autonomy of Kosovo was suspended by the then President of the Republic of Yugoslavia uh, and the government uh, of the Republic of Yugoslavia, uh, and uh, it was uh, in uh, uh, almost exactly 10 years later uh, that armed violence uh, uh, broke out. Uh, so if that's true, that grievance is the antecedent or the progenitor of uh, uh, violence, and if that grievance is based on uh, ethnic categorization, uh, oppression, repression, uh, or possibly worse, uh, then we see the correlation with the potential uh, for genocide. So I assert to you that in this age of increasingly available information telecommunications, uh, that it is simply not tenable to argue that uh, we do not know or if only we knew. We know, and it's quite, uh, quite evident, in fact, uh, what are the possibilities. Let me now refer to a current case, uh, an issued statement two days ago by the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies, based uh, in, in Egypt, in Cairo, uh, on sectarian violence in uh, Mbaba. And I'll just read the press release briefly for you. In light of the sectarian violence that erupted in Mbaba, the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies sent a memo signed by 14 member groups of the Forum of Independent Human Rights Organizations to Prime Minister Essam Sharif yesterday. This is 9th of May. The same memo was sent to the former Prime Minister Ahmed Nazif on January 19th, 2011, after the bombing of two saints' church in Alexandria. In a letter to Dr. Sharif, uh, Bahe Alden Hassan, the director of the Cairo Institute for Human Rights, said that the memo could have been written today and that its recommendations must be implemented by the government Sharif leads. The letter noted that the re refraining from enforcing the law after the burning of the Atrif church by trying the defendants before a rightful judge and not a military tribunal perhaps contributed to the reiteration of the same crime where more people were injured and more people died. The letter stated that unfortunately sectarian violence is likely to increase if the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces and the Cabinet continue to pursue the same policies operative prior to January 25th. Uh, so this is, as you know, uh, last uh, week or some days ago, 12 uh, Coptic Christians were uh, killed and up to 200 injured. That, uh, I would suggest to you, is clear and convincing early warning of a prospective uh, conflict that could amount to genocide in a country with approximately 10% of the population uh, belonging to a Christian minority. Allow me now some historical reflections uh, of, uh, of uh, let me say, some developments of international politics and law. And uh, we heard already the revolutionary uh, effects of the Westphalian uh, peace in 1648, or what I might call the deal amongst the princes. Uh, which brought a new just order to Europe and actually to the world at that time on the basis of the notion of sovereign equality. The idea that the state or the prince enjoyed exclusive jurisdiction within territory and importantly with regard to persons within that, ter that territory, all persons within that territory other than uh, diplomatic representatives of other states. Uh, let me jump forward to the revolution of 1945, approximately 300 years later. Uh, and the conclusion of the Second World War and the, uh, in San Francisco, the adoption of the Charter of the United Nations, which not only reiterated the principle of sovereign equality, but added a new element of justice, not justice between states, but justice within states. And that is to say that the sovereignty of any state with regard to its exclusivity of jurisdiction was conditioned on the protection, respect and protection of human rights, that it was no longer a bar uh, neither to uh, uh, standards of conduct, but actually to the treatment of persons in the jurisdiction uh, in terms of interference from other states. But quite to the contrary, the state itself was bound by a public international duty to respect and to protect that population. Let me suggest for you that that, that, uh, that new normative framework uh, also proposed uh, a concept of international cooperation 
expressly mentioned in the Charter, uh, which foresaw that uh, peace and security was based on justice between states and justice within states, and only on this new framework of peace and security could social and economic development be achieved uh, for the globe on a progressive basis. Now within that framework, the prevailing framework, let me suggest to you that in recent times, uh, one of the primary presumptions of both of those revolutionary paradigms, the Westphalian and the post-charter, or the charter uh, paradigm, were based on uh, fundamental fiction. And that fiction is the power of the state. The state as an abstract entity that comprises according to the definition uh, asserted in the Montevideo Treaty of 1933 that a state comprises a permanent population, a defined territory, an effective government with the capacity to enter into re uh, relations with other states, I would say to be held responsible with other states, assumes that such a state enjoys those capacities, that the territory is clearly defined, that population is permanent, that government is effective. And I th that it may not have ever been the case, it is increasingly not the case, that the nature of the state itself is undergoing enormous, uh, enormous pressure and is less and less capable of actually fulfilling these terms of its very definition. Uh, let me say that this became more complicated post-Congress of Vienna in the 19th century, uh, 18th century, uh, sorry, 19th century, um, uh, when the nature of the state uh, became assimilated with the concept of nation state, that the uh, fundamental um, uh, motivating element that actually created the state and gave it a justification was not the effective control of a responsible authority, but was the uh, proposition that the, that the nation itself had a destiny to be served by an effective government. And that that principle itself was then asserted in 1918 by Woodrow Wilson, former president of the United States, in his 14 points, where he declared that every nation shall have a state and that every nation had a right to self-determination with regard to its state. Again, I'd like to observe another fiction, a fiction that the state not only was clear, defined, and capable of being held responsible, but that the state could perform the functions of protector and provider as a principal protector and principal provider. Again, it may not have been entirely the case in any of those periods I mentioned, but I would suggest it is less and less the case today. If that's true, then we might ask ourselves what is the nature of sovereignty and whether there is, in fact, equality. And if sovereignty is questionable and equality is uncertain, when I, mean, when I say equality, I mean between states. And let me just propose for you a quick reflection on whether you really think that the state of Tuvalu is sovereign in its equality, uh, its real equality, with the state of uh, the People's Republic of China or the United States of America. Uh, if this, uh, these propositions are, in fact, uh, not entirely true, then we have to reflect upon what is the basis of the paradigm in which we have been constructing our, con our contemporary international relations. So let me suggest to you that uh, if, in fact, these fictions are uh, really challenges for us, what are those challenges concretely? The first, uh, first challenge I would propose uh, that we take into account is the challenge of complex interdependence and the increasing role of non-state actors. So first of all, in terms of complex interdependence, it simply is no longer true, if it was ever true, that one state acting alone can shield its population or provide fully for its population to the exclusion of any cooperation with any other state. We're seeing that right now, for example, in, uh, in uh, North Korea. In fact, we're seeing the total impoverishment and probably uh, the mass death of uh, large swaths of the population uh, because actually that state is not capable, is not capable of uh, providing uh, for that population. But we know that that's true in a, many other ways. For example, uh, as a result of environmental uh, um, developments with regard to the environment and specifically climate change. It's simply not possible for any state, one state acting alone, to secure its frontiers, to maintain its sovereignty, uh, to protect and provide for its population. It is simply necessary in order for environmental quality to be assured that states cooperate. Uh, Environment might be sufficiently obvious and compelling, but you might not think that that was true, for example, when it comes to monetary policy. Uh, but I just ask you to reflect on the global financial crisis of a couple of years ago, in fact, continuing on, which incidentally was, not, not, uh, was only the latest in global financial crisis. You might, uh, some of you might be too young to recall 
the Asian contagion of the 1990s, which was a mass, a very quick um, uh, currency um, a devaluation that began, I believe, in Thailand or Southeast Asia in any event. And within 24 hours, it spilled across most of the world, affecting the capacity of states, for example, to meet their foreign exchange, uh, their, their balance of uh, payments, and uh, to see their foreign exchanges dissolve and so forth. Um, so uh, the integration of the global financial um, system is such that, again, no single state acting alone is capable of... Uh, of uh, living up to this fictional concept of the sovereign. Uh, a third example uh, I'd like to suggest for you is a notion of, um, of uh, human security, uh, and particularly security not in the sense of security of, uh, of borders, although we can certainly contest that physical borders, uh, but more the capacity now of uh, actors simply to pierce or transcend borders through telecommunications, through all sorts of means, for example, uh, through uh, threats uh, so-called contemporary threats to security, uh, such as uh, uh, through um, uh, individual um, uh, organizations, uh, non-state organizations like Al-Qaeda, uh, which are not generated by the state, have no an, uh, interest in being a state, uh, have no uh, state aspirations. In fact, it's not quite clear what the aspirations are, except possibly nihilistic. Uh, but they now occupy the principal position in terms of a war, global war on terror, uh, in terms of a, a contemporary uh, security threat. Uh, I could go on with some of the other examples. I'll mention another one, food security. Very few states in the world, I'm not actually familiar with almost any state in the world, which is entirely secure uh, unto itself in terms of its own food uh, agriculture production. In fact, many, many states are actually dependent, entirely dependent on the production of uh, other states and have actually outsourced, we might say, their entire food production. In the case of Japan, it's 90%. Um, Japan, 90% dependent on uh, uh, production elsewhere. In fact, uh, I'm not sure the exact details, uh, but roughly speaking, the world's uh, global food supply at any one time does not exceed more than about two to three months. Uh, the global food uh, uh, integration is so, is so acute uh, that if there are, and that's why we see price fluctuations, if there are mass failures, crop failures in one part of the world uh, within fairly short periods of time, uh, prices uh, are affected substantially. And of course, those who are not in the capacity to pay uh, suffer uh, directly, including with their lives. So this kind of global interdependence is enormous. Uh, and uh, into this, I want to add uh, another element uh, to be observed, which is uh, the difference with regard to actually just terms of life. And what I mean by that is not the value system, although that's something to be discussed in a moment, uh, but the actual opportunities uh, shared opportunities uh, for uh, full lives and dignity of freedom and actually enjoyable quality of life. Uh, so, for example, life expectancy in Japan currently exceeds 84 years of age per, per person, and life expectancy in Sierra Leone is about 42 years of age, in other words, half. Can we actually say, therefore, that Sierra Leoneans enjoy an equal life uh, uh, chance uh, as Japanese? Of course they don't, and worse than that, People in Sierra Leone, no, they don't. It's increasingly evident that this disparity in terms of uh, uh, life chances is not only not equal, but it is enormous uh, in, its, uh, in its inequality or inequality, uh, which poses problems. So uh, complex interdependence as part of the global reality uh, actually says that a system founded on the sovereignty of individual states is simply not fit for purpose, does not match the actual needs or circumstances of the global system, of the global uh, challenges. I mentioned that, uh, uh, that uh, complex interdependence is uh, a principal point. A second point is the decline of the state per se. And what I mean by that is that the state's, chain, uh, state's fundamental function has been changing. Uh, it, insofar as it used to be conceived as the protector and provider uh, of uh, welfare of life uh, uh, itself, uh, the state no longer is really capable of performing uh, uh, either of those functions entirely. It's dependent on many other actors. And therefore, the state has actually changed its function, principally to a regulator uh, and uh, to a, uh, uh, an agent of increasingly uh, complex web of uh, international arrangements. The state is an actor or an agent of international uh, arrangements. That might seem odd, because normally we say that intergovernmental organizations are actually agents of the state. 
But in fact, what's happened is the state has so consistently ceded elements of its sovereignty, of its former exclusivity, that now these inter intergovernmental organizations and arrangements hold uh, power above the state. And the very obvious one is the European Union, which now possesses about 100% of economic policy in Europe, especially if you start to take things like monetary policy for Eurozone countries. Eurozone countries have given up 100% of their monetary policy, an extraordinary thing, which countries fought for hundreds of years to obtain, have given away. Uh, and that was because the state realized it actually couldn't fulfill that function. Uh, and therefore, there is a question where the state no longer has that traditional function of where lies the actual legitimate authority and responsibility for the, uh, for the uh, management of global goods and interests. So in this context, we see that there are inescapable facts uh, of a new global, uh, a new, uh, global reality uh, where, uh, where we live with uh, contemporary threats, uh, where new uh, needs uh, and, uh, and new challenges exist, and where we don't yet have the sufficiently constructed political legal system that is fit for this purpose. We assert that there are certain shared values at the basis of this, some within the Charter of the United Nations, some within some other um, agreed terms, but I would submit to you these are relatively modest and are, st are still significantly contested. Worse than that, the actual institutional framework that's necessary for any political legal system to be affected remains fragile and modest. And I would submit to you potentially increasingly contested as we see that the polarity of the world is dispersed and new powers emerge who are going to contest uh, some of the limitations or historical constraints upon them. Now, I don't want to paint an entirely negative picture of the world because I think this is actually, um, uh, uh, in some senses, a new opportunity. A new opportunity particularly for new powerful actors which combine uh, mobilizing capacity, um, shared values, uh, to actually create uh, the structures and institutions for a new uh, fit-for-purpose political legal system. Uh, and let me just uh, now turn to the question of um, of uh, cultural diversity and its management as one of the challenges where I think there is uh, a new possibility. Uh, first of all, let's just reflect on what is meant by cultural diversity, which is in the first place a, a statement of fact that we live in a world which is culturally diverse, that uh, in terms of language, culture, uh, culture as such, that is to say traditional practices, uh, religious beliefs and religious practices, uh, languages and so forth, uh, the world is not a uniform uh, place. In fact, uh, there are thousands of languages, thousands of faiths, uh, all sorts of subdivisions therein, um, dialects and so forth. Uh, uh, certainly, this is not a contestable matter. But I want to observe in the first place that this is a matter of fact, not a, not a policy issue. The first point is it's a matter of fact that we live in a diverse world. Uh, in addition, that diversity is itself changing and complex. It's not static. It's not true that there are uniform individual communities. Uh, in fact, these communities are changing all the time through all sorts of means, not just through intermarriage or through mobility, but because people actually exercise choice. Common language, for example, you might be born so-called mother tongue uh, context, but as you develop your professional life or you engage otherwise, then your common language or your common references change and evolve. So it's diverse, a factually diverse and complex world. Uh, third point is that this diversity does not admit to a perfect reconciliation of all differences. In other words, there are conflicts. There are simply real conflicts. And I'll just give you some simple examples. We are now using, I think, one language as a means of communication. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I'm not sure if we ha could do a survey in this room, but uh, the number of mother tongues in this room, I would suspect, is probably at least in the scores. Uh, and if we were to say that everyone should be placed on an absolutely equal uh, footing, of, uh, uh, that we would work on each of our equal, uh, equally competent mother tongue, we would probably have a babble and not an effective discourse. So we actually have to make choices. Uh, we can, of course, uh, try through technology, and technology is important to try and reconcile some of those things, but they're not all perfectly reconcilable. For example, certain cultural practices uh, are not reconcilable. As simple as days of Sabbath, for example, which days of school we shall go to, and so forth. So if it's also true that this diversity is a fact, that it is complex, and that it has conflict within it, then the challenge is how do we manage that conflict in a way which is equitable and sustainable. 
and does not uh, result in violence. I would suggest for you, uh, to you that this is possible on the basis of, uh, of a global regime of respect for human rights uh, and also of uh, increasing opportunities for uh, what is increasingly called diversity management. Uh, what I mean by this is that minimum standards of non-discrimination, of equal opportunity, of uh, respect, uh, for example, uh, use of language, uh, uh, for uh, respect for faith, respect for cultural traditions and so forth, is a sine qua non starting point. But then insofar as differences may conflict, that there be an established system of uh, reconciliation, of adjudication, uh, with a, a progressive system of uh, maximization of opportunities for alternatives, for example, autonomy regimes and so forth. This implies a system of governance. It's not possible in the absence of a system of governance and adjudication, because there will be differences uh, which are going to be contested and not simply accepted. However, if in such a system that diversity is managed well, then the opportunities for grievance will be diminished, and better than that, the capacities for full lives and dignity and freedom, where people feel uh, competent and, uh, and able uh, and also uh, confident to invest uh, in their lives and to take their, uh, uh, pursue their interests, uh, their needs and their aspirations individually and collectively, this will become a new opportunity for fuller lives and dignity and freedom. So that's a positive, open-ended, progressive vision uh, of a future. However, if that is not the case, then I suggest to you that the increasing conflict, the, fr uh, the, fiction, uh, the frictions of conflicting uh, cultures will actually create a poisonous and disastrous spiral of conflict, which will likely uh, result in new instances of genocide as certain groups seek to uh, eliminate their competition or prevail upon others. I've already spoken longer than I had hoped, uh, and I'm very interested to hear any questions or discussion later today, but let me just conclude by suggesting uh, a couple of final uh, um, things. First of all, uh, in, my, uh, in my view, uh, to prevent uh, genocide as uh, to prevent uh, any conflict or any uh, crime requires to tackle the antecedents, the causes uh, of, uh, of the crime or the causes uh, of uh, conflict. And in order to do that requires to be informed, to be enlightened, to be cooperative, and to be determined. Uh, essential in that is a system of governance based on the rule of law, uh, which uh, includes uh, participatory and deliberative decision making and, uh, and fundamentally the respect for human rights of everyone. Accompanying that is the necessity of building the institutions of governance uh, that creates a culture of respect and a culture of, of, uh, of prevention. Uh, if this is possible to achieve, and I believe it is, and if it can be uh, acculturated in terms of a popularized and entrenched system of governance, then I think that rather than facing the prospects of more genocides, we can imagine and we can enjoy a normalized world of uh, freedom and dignity for all, uh, of social and economic development, uh, uh, where concepts of genocide are not only odious, but they become unthinkable, impracticable, and resigned to the dustbin of history. Thank you very much.